Moshe, and this is on the issues. Many of you know this is our continuing series of conversations with news and policy makers, people we like to say are doing interesting, important work in this region and beyond. Today we're going to talk Wisconsin politics. Joining us today are the Speaker of the Assembly, Robin Boss, the Republican from the Burlington area, Racine County, and the Assembly Minority Leader, Peter Barker, the Democrat from Kenosha. Gentlemen, thanks for being with us. Let's give them a warm welcome. Thank you. We're delighted to have the two of them uh, uh, together in this room, although the two of you actually do this from time to time. This is not uncommon for the Republican boss and the Democrat market to get together and talk Wisconsin politics, is it? Yeah, no, not at all. We actually have a, a once a month series. It's called Civil Dialogue, where Peter and I uh, have it on Wisconsin Ice. So for any of you who watch it, uh, I'm sure you probably all follow along on a monthly basis. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but for those of you who watch Wisconsin Ice, we have a good time. Yeah, not only that, uh, we did an event at the governor's mansion uh, during December when we gave each other speeches. Oh, that's right. We're, we're pretty accustomed to what we're going to say. <laughs> well, let me... Uh, I think uh, it won't be spontaneous. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. But very spontaneous. Um, let me, first of all, thank you for, for being with us. And, and, and maybe this is a good place to start our conversation today. Uh, you're talking about uh, civility in politics. And, and a couple of years ago, the state legislature was a pretty tough place to be. Um, what's it like today? Well, it's definitely different. Uh, I think that for some, those scars are a bit deeper than others. Uh, I look at the fact that we were able to make pretty significant changes in Wisconsin. Right or wrong, uh, they are in the past. And wrong. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's definitely repeated. That's okay. <laughs> but I would say that the whole point of having a debate and discussion is to not focus only on the past. I mean, yes, you want to make changes. You want to try to correct things that you think were an injustice on one side or the other. But I try to focus as much as we can on the future. Peter and I had a really good start of the year. I give him credit for that. Uh, because we both said, look, we can either keep arguing about what's happened in the past, we can try to find common ground and move forward. Uh, we had a good first day. We agreed to co-sponsor together uh, for probably the first time in an inaugural celebration where Republicans and Democrats were in the same room celebrating something that should be a nonpartisan day. Uh, we then went to the floor later that next week and we were able to pass a rules package, the vast majority of which we agreed on, not all of it, but the vast majority of which uh, just yesterday, we were able to pass uh, Bill's job. Bill's up. I had some consternation from my own caucus because we had a Democrat bill on the calendar, heaven forbid, uh, but there was a Democrat bill that we actually thought was a good idea. Uh, so we're trying to put some of those things in the past. We still have a lot to argue about, but there are definite ways we can work together on Captain Brown. How would you describe the atmosphere? Well, much better. And really, the Speaker's part, I mean, we, as the Speaker indicated, it's true. I mean, we sat down together, and, and we feel that, look, the people of the state have better confidence in their government when they can see that there is civility, when they're making efforts to uh, agree to disagree on certain things. There'll be certain things that will be very contentious. Uh, next week, I suspect, might be one of them on the mining issue. Uh, but on the other end of the spectrum, uh, not everything has to be contentious. And so we're making every effort to, you know, try and set an example, a positive example. Uh, I think everybody's distressed that what's going on in Washington with being so dysfunctional at this juncture with such discord and no agreement. We're trying to find ways and pathways to not have that happen here. And uh, and I think it's important. I mean, this state has a tradition of people rolling up their sleeves, attempting to work together, attempting to make progress on behalf of the citizens of the state. And so we're going to keep uh, striving for that as much as we can. The last two years, uh, as I said, at the Communist Association at the end of the year, they asked uh, myself and uh, Senator Fitzgerald what we tell them to do incoming uh, elected members, and I told them I hope they would have amnesia in terms of the way in which business was conducted. Uh, obviously, we can't forget many of the policies, and we're still going to be battling over those. But, you know, the idea that you need to lock people out of the building, you turn off people's microphones, uh, you know, you uh, violate the rules, uh, um, we're a huge problem, frankly. Luckily, Peter's on the uh, But, uh, <laughs> What's that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I haven't forgotten. I'm still fresh memories, but uh, but that hasn't happened this session. And I think our speaker Ross leadership that won't happen this time. Well, well, let me raise uh, something that was uh, uh, sort of hanging over the events of the last couple of years, and this was the John Doe probe. And, and some, some of you in the room know uh, the decision has been made to end the John Doe probe. It's over now. Uh, what's your reaction to that? Be able to speak to that. Well, I give credit to Governor Walker, first of all, because you remember the entire way this John Doe investigation began was that he suspected things in his office were not going the way that they should, and people were following the same ethical standard that he 
wanted out of the employees in his office. He contacted the DA, the DA began the investigation, and people were charged. That's the process that we should utilize. I think that unfortunately people in the heat of a political campaign with recall began to try to draw some uh, negativity toward Governor Walker because he did that. We now know that that chapter, once again, of Wisconsin is closed. He's been totally vindicated. He did nothing wrong. Uh, somebody who's innocent uh, should maintain that innocence until they're proven guilty. The DA said there was nothing to do with the draft charge, so the process worked as it should have. Unfortunately, people attempted to use it for political purposes, uh, and that was really unfortunate for everybody. No, I don't think there was anything political about it at all. I mean, this was a, a criminal investigation. Six people have been prosecuted. Obviously, it was a very serious violation uh, uh, of the taxpayers of the state with many of the activities and served to the veterans of uh, one particular post. And so it is over. I think for the good of the state, I'm glad it's over. Uh, we don't want to replicate Illinois and have our governors in prison. Um, however, um, this state has a reputation for clean, open, and honest government. And we need, I think at this point, the governor who said he couldn't speak before this, now would be wise to make a statement and uh, to apologize. Uh, because it was under his watch, he hired these people, he supervised these people, and under his watch, uh, the taxpayers were cheated, the veterans were cheated, and uh, he should just outline what he's going to do different, and how he's going to try to assure that this won't happen again. He was extremely critical of his predecessor when one of uh, his employees, was criminally prosecuted and later exonerated. And uh, so he should try to live up to those same high standards he was calling on our his predecessor to uh, live up to. And then we should move on. What do you think about the policy? Do you think that's appropriate or not? I mean, it's Governor Walker's decision. I think that any time someone who works for you violates your trust, not only is it sad for the taxpayers, but it's sad as a manager. Uh, you cannot take and micromanage every one of your employees, especially I think in Milwaukee County, you know, there are four or five thousand employees. He does not know what each one does every day. Uh, so if he chose to do that, I think that'd be fine. If he doesn't choose, uh, choose to, that's his decision. Let's talk policy. Uh, there's a lot going on in Madison right now. We'll, we'll walk through some of the, uh, well, the uh, key pieces of the uh, state budget in a moment. Uh, but I do want to spend a couple of moments on mining uh, and mining reform legislation. As most of you in this room know, the uh, Senate passed it by one vote uh, last week. The Assembly will vote on it. I mean, this week. The Assembly will vote on it uh, Thursday or yep. this week. Um, and, and it will, in all way, do the past. Uh, I guess the question is, and, and, I'll, and I will put this around here in a second, but I'm going to be giving the speaker pause again. I know, he likes the last word, it's okay. Well, no, in this case, <laughs> since you're the party in, in, in power, um, I think it's appropriate. Uh, give me your sense, um, at the end of the day, there, there's still a lot of talk about possible legal action. There is still a talk about the ever-changing higher order market. Um, at the end of the day, are we going to see hundreds, if not thousands, of jobs from this for, is that really the final step? No, I definitely believe that we are going to see an operational iron mine in northern Wisconsin. Uh, let's just talk about for a minute how the process has happened. Uh, last spring, uh, a year ago now, uh, the company came to us saying, look, the mining laws in Wisconsin really don't allow us to open up an active operational mine where you can make a profit. Even Democrats have conceded that, that there were problems and uh, began the process of having a bill that was introduced. Uh, they did not like the way we introduced the bill. And I have to be honest to say that the bill that we're going to vote on on Thursday is a better bill than it was a year ago. Uh, that's part of the system that we go through. I was proud of the one, and I think it would have been good, but the one that we have now is going to be better. Uh, we have taken and probably had more hearings on this bill, more opportunity for testimony, more opportunity for changes uh, than anything besides the state budget. You recall last spring, Senator Darling and I took the bill that passed the state Senate, trying to hurt the assembly, trying to compromise with Senator Schultz to get him there. I think he requested nine changes to the bill. We gave him seven of the nine, but he wanted all nine, or he wouldn't vote yes. Well, that's not really the consensus process of give and take. So we couldn't get a bill passed, and we came to this fall, or the, the fall we had the election. I think if you look at the 18th Senate District with uh, Senator Gudex, the main reason that I believe he won was because he wanted to have a mining bill pass that would really bring mining jobs here, a Republican majority came back to the state side. We began the process again, more and more changes. Uh, I think we had over 20 changes to the bill that we had negotiated out of joint finance, all of which were protecting the environment, ensuring that we had more process that gave uh, additional responsibilities to those who protect the environment the most. And we have a bill now which has got broad consensus. Uh, there are some who are opposed to it and who will be no matter what. Uh, I have met with Chairman Wiggins, the Bad River uh, 
band of Chippewa, have said to me that under no circumstances will they support a mine. No circumstances. Well, it's pretty hard to negotiate with somebody who says under no circumstances will I support your bill. Uh, and there were environmentalists who were in that same exact category who have now tried to make a political issue out of something that should really just be a policy difference. But that's their right. And I think the bill will pass and will have broad Republican support. I wish it would be bipartisan. And Peter could make news today as you say that. Well, it could be bipartisan. In fact, you know what? It's very simple. We just take the actual bipartisan bill that Senator Collins, Senator Schultz, and Senator Jolf worked on and pass that. And we will have a bipartisan bill, and we'll have a better bill. Well, it will bill that actually will lead to more of a likelihood that you could actually cite a mine and save the taxpayers millions of dollars in attorney fees in the process. Um, the bill that we have before us is a little bit better bill, and I, and I do want to give the speaker credit for making an effort to make it a little bit better. But it still falls far short of what I think would be uh, a mining law that could work effectively for this state. You know, Senator, you know, I'm one of the lead authors of the, in the assembly of the Cullen Bill, but really it's Senator Cullen, Senator Schultz, and Senator Jell, all of whom have been in leadership spots, all of whom highly responsible legislators on both sides of the aisle, as Democrats and Republicans, and both are majority leaders. And uh, they work extremely hard. They followed a process that really is a model for Wisconsin, of going to northern Wisconsin, going around the state, collecting testimony, and listening and incorporating it into a bill that mirrors almost identically Minnesota's laws, which Minnesota's one of the leading mining states in the country. And that's a process I think people would feel far more comfortable with, and it is a bipartisan bill. Um, on the process, I think some people would even acknowledge that the process wasn't so good this time. Um, you know, the authors of the bill refused to submit to public question. We've got, I don't know if we've ever seen that before. They said, come to our office and we'll privately answer any questions you have. Now, because Speaker Voss, they did later answer the questions in writing, which I did appreciate. But that is not good for Wisconsin democracy. Authors of bills should testify on the record, answer questions on the record, so we can examine their responses. And so other experts can look at their responses and find out where there may be flaws and find out where there may be commonality where we can come together. So we won't pass a bipartisan bill. Um, uh, come next week, uh, but we could have. The uh, Senate was one vote away from being able to do that. Um, so uh, we'll see how this goes forward. My prediction, though, Mike, in conclusion, is that we will end up spending millions of dollars once again, as we've done over the last couple of years in attorney fees, because of passing the flawed bill. Do you think there's any chance this will be a replay of what happened in Crane? I, I worked in Wausau many years ago uh, when they were talking about signing a mine. And this thing ended up being tied up in court forever. And never happened. Is that a possibility? It is possible. I mean, we're in the law school. Uh, lawyers make a whole lot of money to sue people. Uh, so is it, will it surprise me that there will probably be a lawsuit filed? No. Uh, that's why we have done everything we possibly can to prepare for that eventuality. Because as I mentioned, the Bad River Chippewa are going to sue no matter what. So we did not willy-nilly craft a bill without considering the consequences. But it's a likelihood that this will end up in court. We did take some of the better ideas of Senator Collins' proposal. Uh, one of the simple ideas that we had is providing certainty in the mining statute. Right now, you can literally go a decade never getting an answer yes or no. That's not right. So Senator Collins proposed the timeline, and so did we. It's 100 days difference. It's three months. So there's a lot of things where you hear these dramatic changes. They're not really that different. Uh, what I always fear is that I want a bill that passes that will actually have a good likelihood in mining jobs coming here. Sometimes I think that what environmentalists and some of those who didn't want to be against jobs, they wanted a bill that they could say they were for that would never actually result in the mine being built. And I believe that's what Senator Collins' bill would do, is it would give us the opportunity, which politicians love to do, to stand up and wave a flag and say we did something. But years from now, we won't ever actually see a mine. Take 20 seconds to respond to that. Well, first of all, this changes mining laws for any future mining in the state, so we should be cognizant of that. But from an environmental standpoint, you know, currently the DNR can issue stop orders. They find there's enormous, you know, uh, potential for serious environmental degradation. They can stop things and it's cracked. This no longer this would change that process. So they can't have that authority. You have to somehow get to court to be able to make that happen. The attorney general. Um, this is this is um, one of the more sensitive areas of the state because of the fact that the flowage that leads to lakes. <coughs> you know, I traveled the globe before I came back to the legislature. Clean water is one of the most precious resources that we have. 
The Great Lakes are the largest freshwater uh, supply in the world. And so we want to be careful. We have scores of pages of exemptions and, uh, uh, for environmental laws. And, and it's not needed. But we will not be exempting uh, the Bad River Chippewa, who already are polluting uh, the Bad River period today. Let, let me jump in, though, and ask very quickly, and again, I want to move on here. Um, isn't it possible that at the end of the day you can craft a piece of legislation that meets all the things that you feel need be in it? But yet a company is going to say, I'm not going to do business. You've got the perfect piece of legislation, mm -hmm. but you don't have anybody wanting to do business. Isn't that, that, possible? that is possible. There's no question about that, Mike, and I'll acknowledge that up front. But it's also possible you can craft the perfect bill that a company wants that they'll do business and <coughs> including your water supply for generations. So somewhere in the middle is where you want to aim for is they have a process like Minnesota, which is what the Cullen Bill does, that does have a process work for mining companies, numerous mining companies in Minnesota, um, without having to change forever your environmental protection standards. But Peter, we still have the EPA and the DNR, who both have to sign off on it. I mean, as far as I know, President Obama is still in office. He is not going to sign off on a mine that results in environmental degradation of Lake Superior. <coughs> Whether or not you believe Governor Walker, and I believe he does, I think the DNR has the exact same people in place from before Governor Walker was in office as far as those who will give approvals to the mining company. They're not going to all of a sudden become right-wing you know, radicals. The same people are in place. So I, I think it's kind of a red area. Let me talk about the budget. And, and I'm going to begin with, the, uh, I guess, the so-called centerpiece of the budget, and that is the tax cut, the income tax cut. Um, and I'll, I'll begin this time with the uh, Peter Walker. <coughs> The Democrats just feel this is the wrong approach, or our taxes are okay in Wisconsin, because the initial reaction from Democrats just very negative. It's not a good idea. It'd be about a $200 uh, difference for a family, a typical family in Wisconsin, over two years. So, you know, you guys say that's $2 a month, a cup of coffee a week, or something like that. You know, it's, um, but, or less than that. No, I mean, quite to the contrary. I mean, obviously, you know, the president ran on the class tax board. We believe in middle tax, you know, middle class tax rate. I think it's very important. So how you do this makes all the difference. Um, but secondly, you know, I think the Republicans are very effective in giving all this message that was actually not true, that somehow they balanced the budget without raising taxes last time. They did raise taxes. But who did they raise taxes on? People that work for eight, nine dollars an hour, you know, through curbing back the uh, earned income tax credit. They raised taxes on seniors through curbing back the homestead credit. So as we look now at where we left off last session, if anybody should be in line to get some tax relief, it should be those that get up every morning, you know, work 40 hours a week, 52 weeks a year, and maybe are working in industries that only can afford to pay me $9 an hour. That's who desperately needs tax relief. And we just got a fiscal bureau paper the other day, and you know, in terms of the amount of tax relief, um, you get a higher, much higher amount of tax relief if you're in the upper income categories and you do it the lower income categories. So uh, we don't like the way this is crafted, obviously. And, you know, we would craft it differently. We would certainly, you know, first of all, restore the earnings and tax credit below what it should have been at, restore the homestead credit, and then try to provide relief, uh, which ironically is better off economically as well. Because those people that work for modest wages, they're the ones that you know, most stimulate the economy because every dime they get a tax relief, you know, they'll use to fix their roof or, you know, or buy new clothes for their children or, or things of that sort. So macroeconomically as well as just economically for individual families, you're far better off for providing relief to those that most need it, which are those that are either struggling to get the middle class or those that are barely in the middle class. Peter Ross, I think you said, and members, some members of your colleagues said, we should be fair. Uh, well, first of all, let me just uh, correct a few things that I consider to represent Parka. Um, I know it's impossible to disagree with. Uh, so, in the last budget, what we did was to give a smaller refund to a few individuals in the state, uh, a small percentage of the state's population. So, under the Earned Income Tax Credit, the whole goal is Ronald Reagan's program. It's one that Republicans in general agree with. Uh, but what happens is, if you work for $8 or $9 an hour, it means you have no income tax liability. You pay zero income taxes. Mm -hmm. 
And what the earned income tax credit does is it takes other people's tax money and it gives you a much larger refund than beyond what you pay. It pretty much covers the entire cost of your payroll tax, other living expenses. So some would call that outside the tax code a welfare check. But because it's inside the tax code and it's based on having to work, we call it the earned income tax credit. So what Republicans said is we are going to decouple it from an automatic increase that was inside the budget and say, geez, if everybody in the entire state is having to pay less uh, or having to take less home, and because it had to act 10 if you're a public employee, we had to leave the tax increases over a billion dollars put in by the Democrats, we didn't repeal any of those. Pretty hard to say that we're going to give an automatic increase to one small segment of society. So that's what is considered a tax increase. Uh, what our budget actually does is it says we're going to reverse that trend. We are going to stay, uh, President Obama, once again, no wild-eyed uh, conservative, said that your middle income is earning less than $250,000 a year. That's what he ran on. That's what he told the American public, the middle class. So our budget actually says $221,000 and below is considered middle class. So not even as high as President Obama said. And we are going to give tax relief to every single person underneath that $221,000. Now common sense would tell you if you earn $200,000, you know, two people both working, or if you earn $20,000, you're going to get more at two hundred dollars than you would at twenty. dollars that is what the rub is. They are saying that we should somehow bias it toward people just at the moment. I want to give it to every single person in the state in that middle income category, actually in all categories, who pay far too much in income taxes. Uh, so yes, uh, I chaired a symposium with Republicans and Democrats over the summer that, talked, that looked at where our income tax code is in relation to the rest of the country. You know what we discovered? If you are poor in Wisconsin, if you are below that twenty-two to $24,000 category, uh, it is one of the best places in the country, as far as income taxes, to live. Uh, out of the 43 states that have an income tax, we're like number 38, with number one being the worst and 43 being the best. So a good place, because we help to take care of those who are less able. If you're in the wealthy category, uh, we are about number 15. So certainly not the best place to be successful, but not the worst. But if you're middle income, that 20,000 to 200,000, we're number four. We are one of the worst places in the country to be a middle income tax. And that's why when Governor Walker and I talked about this, we decided that's the best category to go after. Uh, I hope we can find additional ways to look at our tax code, taking out loopholes, special interest giveaways, things that were put in by Republicans and Democrats. There's no one party who has a monopoly on trying to fight corporate welfare. We're doing the same thing. So I hope that we'll be able to take some of those make additional... Make it bigger. Yeah, make it bigger. How much bigger? Uh, we don't know yet. We're still in the process of working that out. My colleague, Dale Cuyenga from Brookfield, is actually heading up our efforts. We have already identified uh, several tax credits, which some would call a corporate loophole. That's what I would call them. Others would say uh, that they were focused uh, on some of the tax credits that they gave last time on job creation. We think we can eliminate those and just simply reduce the rates for everybody, and that's a better use of tax dollars than picking winners. But let me say just one thing in response here, very briefly, and that's the idea. It is an ironic how far the right Republican Party has moved. When you've got Ronald Reagan and Tommy Thompson, who I work with on the welfare reform measures, in order to keep people off welfare, we want to make people better off by working the network. And now, back then, the governor and President Reagan called this essential tax relief. Now they call it welfare. And you know, it just shows to me how far they've gravitated. And in speech after speech, I hear Republicans refer to it as welfare. And it's not welfare. It is tax relief for those that struggle the most. And it is true with what the speaker said. It does complete, you know, it is for people that do not have any tax on liability. It does help them with other expenses. But make no, make no mistake about it. If you're, a, let's say, a single parent and you're working at $8 an hour, you have $16,000 in an income. And let's say you have two children. Imagine trying to get by on that level. And don't forget, no matter how much money you make, you still pay sales taxes, you still pay property taxes in one place, or if you pay rent, you're still paying, helping to subsidize that property tax payment. So it's not a good deal to work for $8 an hour. It's extremely difficult. And that's why we believe it's people at those wage levels that are struggling to get by that will help this economy enormously if we just help them a little bit to support their family and dignity. One of the things that makes me the angry and we had to be yesterday on this uh, for uh, providing uh, support for companies in some cases for worker training, which I think is great. It's something I believe is one of the best things we can do, and I'm glad we move forward with that. But we used to always have in this state, you had to at least pay a family supporting job. Because I think it's wrong when somebody works 40 hours a week, 
52 weeks a year, and he has to suffer the indignity of standing in a food stand. I just don't think that's right. And that's why I, that's why I guess I'm so adamant when it comes to things like the earning tax credit, because these are people that are doing the right thing. They're not being on welfare. They are working every day. But they're falling further and further behind. Well, let's remember, Peter, <coughs> we just had a study done that if you are earning $24,000 a year in a family of three in Wisconsin, the amount of benefits that taxpayers give you between the health insurance that you get for free, right, the rent assistance that the taxpayer provide for you, the earned income tax credit, the opportunity for energy assistance, a free cell phone, you add all of that together, it's worth $25,000 a year. So a person who is earning significantly less mm -hmm. is really at the same wage as a state legislature. But ironically, you make my point. So why should we subsidize a company to hire somebody at that wages so then the taxpayers still have to subsidize their health care and their, you know, and their housing and, and get food stamps for them? I mean, that's why I think it's wrong to subsidize jobs that are at $8 an hour. That's why we've always had in this state provisions that you have to pay a family supporting. But that's not where the training dollars are going to go. They're going to go to the department, and they will be able to allocate those as we try to keep and attract companies. Uh, I would rather have the money go toward higher skilled jobs that need more training. You don't need a whole lot of training. I would too. Look at McDonald's do it. I mean, we're not giving it to people who work at McDonald's. We're giving it to people who are in manufacturing. Now, unfortunately, in the world we live in today, some manufacturing jobs are 12 or $13 an hour when they start. You get training somebody at 12 bucks an hour, but eventually over time they might be at 20. If the category that you wanted is everybody had to be at a $20 skill, it would only go to train people who are already working in a company. I want to train people who are going to get a brand new hire who might be at the lower end and work themselves up the scale. I'm, I'm gonna, I know you want to combine that, but that's okay. We don't want to. I know, it's, 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 it's great. Right. We can talk for all Something we care about. <laughs> that's, that's good to see. Uh, so let's kind of continue, I guess, on this theme. Um, the governor decided to turn down the full expansion. Uh, and I think his argument was, I want to make people less dependent on the government. Uh, we can do this ourselves. We can still put another 200,000 plus people uh, under insurance. Maybe they'll go to the federal health exchanges instead, more of them, instead of going to Medicaid. But I, I just don't believe the federal government is going to be able to fund this program long term. That's essentially it. Why would we make this decision? 
the, government, the federal government will pay 100% for the next two or three years. I think it's three, you know, and for three years, 100%. So that's why, you know, liberal governors like uh, we have in Michigan and John Kasich in Ohio, who I serve with in Congress, and uh, um, Jan Brewer in Arizona, and Susan Martinez in uh, New Mexico, accepted the money. And so you have, let me just finish, so you have a number of Republicans that are saying, what kind of fiscal decision is this? So taxpayers are going to, Wisconsin taxpayers, are not going to have to pay 100% of this free where the federal government would pay it. Why would we make a decision like that? It's not as if when the governor misled people on the train money where he said, don't worry, we can use it for roads, we found out we couldn't. In this money, we can't, like, use it for something different. All these other states around us, and, and uh, states led by conservative Republicans, <laughs> are accepting that money. So that means our state taxpayers are going to pay more. But, you know, to are even sidestep the federal government is, is good for that money down the road? Well, and here's the issue, and I met with the governor this week on Wednesday on this very issue, and I said, well, governor, why not? I said, am I correct that we could take this for the next two or three years, and then if the, we can't depend on the federal government, we can cancel it? And he said, well, yeah, that is true. We could do that. And he said, I thought about doing that. He said, but then I'm worried that we're creating a new program that we're going to somehow, it's going to be difficult, we're going to be on the hook for. But you know, right now, the economy is still soft, and especially here in Wisconsin, we're 42nd in the nation in job growth. Um, so in two or three years, we could be in an entirely different place, and hopefully we will be. Hopefully the economy will be revved up, and more people will be in the private sector. We'll be able to afford to make those payments that Robin and I both want. Of course we want people to be on private sector health insurance. Of course we want people to be at work. That's what we both are, are you know, we both are struggling in different ways to try to accomplish. But for many people, and you notice how your voice got lower when you talked about that there's no co-pays for the very low. Um, there are co-pays in many of these programs. And people are paying what they can pay. But what's low for you and I are not low for people working for $8 an hour. And you have is two kids, if, you have, optional co -pays. if you have two children, you know, again, you're making $16,000 a year trying to support those kids. You say, well, it's only $10 a month. $10 a month is great for, for you or I is nothing. For somebody that can is having a hard time putting food on the table, that's a lot of money. So they're contributing what they can. And, of course, with the Affordable Care Act, you know, everybody is going to have to contribute something, as I understand, going forward. And, uh, but this is desperately needed. This is $4 billion, and the other irony is, uh, by most estimates, it's 10,500 jobs. That's far more jobs than you're going to get off any mine that may or may not be created in the future. Maybe 30 seconds, then we'll move on to the next topic. Oh, just agree with you. Yeah, <laughs> so many things. Well, let's just start by saying, under the Affordable Care Act, if you make $11,000 a year, yes, you have a $19 a month co care premium. But right. you know what the deductible is? $2,000. So for those of us who had concerns about Obamacare going forward and having it be unsustainable, they are even more validated when you look at the facts of the plan. There is no way, and it's ironic, we're on sequester day, where we are arguing about whether or not we are going to cut less than half a percent out of the increase in spending. But we're not talking about increase in spending. We're not talking about Obamacare here. We're talking about the state's decision but it's the same whether thing. or not we want to have the Andrew Fear expanded, which, you know, Tommy Thompson, who used to be considered a conservative Republican, was the one that started. It's now he's a liberal. In fact, when I ran into him, they were afraid of Dick Miller's funeral. He said, hey, Peter, I'm a liberal now. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and he is part of the reason that we have a massive deficit under Governor Dorothy. Let me uh, make you my point. That's true. That's true. Let me uh, uh, do two things. One, uh, we're going to run five minutes late today since we started five minutes late. That's only fair. But I don't want to get you in trouble when you go back to work. Uh, classes, so I just want to give you a heads up. Uh, and we do understand it. Uh, two issues that uh, people in this part of the state know a lot about um, residency and vouchers, uh, and because both are in the budget. And, uh, and, and let's begin with, with the residency issue. I see the mayor sitting over there today. I know he's not a fan of the uh, governor's proposal that would end, uh, for all municipal employees around the state, the, uh, the residency requirement. Right? You have to live in the town. Is that going to be part of the budget at the end of the day? Is it going to be removed from the budget? Where do we stand? Uh, I believe it will. Right? Yeah. Uh, I believe it will stay in the budget. But we have to wait and see the policy list that comes up with this bureau. How do people in your party feel about it? Uh, in general, I think the vast majority of people uh, on my side of the aisle believe you should be able to live where you choose to live. Uh, think of the world that we are in. 
Uh, I'm sure you probably saw the news where Yahoo had a policy where any of their employees could work from anywhere in the country. They didn't have to actually ever go into the office. They're now changing that back where you have to actually come into work on a regular basis. But that's a decision that people make in every single circumstance based on what is best for the workers who are inside that workplace. To have an artificial limit that says we only want to hire people from one municipality, it's just old and antiquated. If the criteria was, for, let's say for a fire department, we want to be able to have people respond to an emergency, so instead we said they have to live within 20 minutes of the fire station. Okay, that is directly related to their job based on what they think is the criteria to make them into an employee that would be more usable at the workplace. But to just say you could live further away in the city, but not necessarily live closer if you were in a different municipality, really is just all about politics. It's not actually about the job that they're doing or the freedom to attract better employees. So is it, is it an issue if you have, for example, the state of Milwaukee, thousands of people applying for these jobs who know full well that they would be required to live in the city? Is it an issue that needs to be addressed if that is the current situation? Well, there's no doubt. Let's just look at the Milwaukee schools right now. Uh, they have over 700 open positions uh, that they are looking to hire. And what have they done? They said, we're going to go and try to recruit people in Spain and other countries to come to work here. I would rather say that, you know what, let's go out and recruit people who live anywhere in the state. Maybe they have a spouse who works in Madison and they want to live in Delafield so they can live <coughs> in the middle. Wouldn't you want to have the very best person who's a teacher be able to teach at MPS, regardless of whether or not they live in the geography of where the city of Milwaukee is? I would. I think it's about the employee and the results, not at the place that they choose to, you know, pay their life bill. Do you, do you think that Democrats and, and maybe some Republicans, I guess, would be to be seen, do you think there's any chance that President Steve will not be approved? Well, first of all, any other department? Well, I, they have votes. Uh, you know, in all likelihood, they can probably pass uh, most anything, certainly in the Assembly. Um, but, you know, the issue is, and is that, first of all, it illustrates what's wrong with that kind. These are subjects of negotiation between employees and employers. We don't elect a governor to be king, to make decisions for every community, every township, every village, as to what he thinks is right. This was a subject of negotiation. And the mayor's been extremely articulate on this point when he brings up the fact that they have hundreds of people applying for these police and fire positions, knowing that that's a requirement. And in my judgment, this should be a subject of negotiation. And it's something that should be negotiated between an employer and employee. But that's a problem. Now you have a situation where the governor is going to hand out benefits to certain people outside of the collective bargaining and take away certain benefits from other groups of employees. And that's never been the way the state has functioned. For the last 50 years, you know, we had Democrats or Republicans as governor that sat across the table and bargained in good faith, sometimes tough, but and tried to work through their differences. But I don't think we want the governor of the state to make decisions of who's going to get what benefits under what circumstances. And that's why we're so polarized as a state right now. Philosophically, though, do you believe that people should be able to live where they want to live? Personally, I would love to be able to see people live where they want to live. It is a different world. I do agree with that. But I think that it should be a negotiated item. I don't think that that's for me to make a decision for Milwaukee or for, for uh, Waterford or for Superior. I mean, these are items that employers and employees negotiate over. Just like your example from Marissa Mayer, who's from Wausau, incidentally. Uh, the new CEO of Yahoo, she made a decision and, and said that she believes that with the, the fiscal situation that Yahoo is in and their competitive situation, right now she wants people to be in the office. So if you're an employee there, you decide, do I want to live under these rules or do I want to leave for some other company in the Silicon Valley which doesn't impose these restrictions? But these are things that employers and employees should be working out, not for the governor, or not for legislators to impose our will on local communities and local decision making. I think that's a mistake. But negotiation requires that each side is willing to discuss it. And the mayor's here, he's already said it. he's not going to do it. They said go to Madison about that. I mean, they, they said go to Madison to fix it. I mean, they said go to Madison to fix it. It's been in place since 1932. Uh, so the only way they can do it is to come to the legislature. We are listening to people, uh, and I have a pretty good feeling that they'll be able to do it. Let's uh, talk about vouchers. The governor wants to expand vouchers in the state of Wisconsin, uh, make it available to my uh, communities. You said you were disappointed. I am. You wanted him to make it available throughout the state. Right. I want universal vouchers. And, and so, explain your, your your reasoning for that. There are different people. You know, people who support vouchers. Uh, something like Howard Fuller uh, would disagree with you. 
that he feels that they were designed to help low-income families. But you see it as a bigger, broader post office. Well, let's just think about where we are as a, a community, as a state, as a nation, uh, in relation to the rest of the world. Uh, I don't know how many of you have seen some of these movies in a million minutes where it talks about the high school experience of India, China, and the United States. Uh, where you look at what's happening in other countries uh, as far as what they are able to do and where we are able to get to, we are falling behind. Uh, we are not doing what it takes to be competitive in the rest of the world. A big reason uh, is the educational system that we have has uh, gone awry in many ways. Uh, I think that we are way too easy uh, on allowing people to get a certificate when they graduate as opposed to having that graduation mean something. Uh, but that's a situation we've got to address in public schools. So as you look at where we are with children who are failing, think about it. If you are a grade behind in one of the first four or five grades of school, uh, every single year that goes by, you build along the, on the one before. Why would we ever say it is more important about who writes the checkout or the light bill in the school as opposed to the results that the school actually has for the students who are inside it? That's what this entire debate is about. The reason that we want a good, educated, young person is that they can become productive for the rest of their lives. I don't necessarily care if they get in a public school, a private school, a voucher system, if they go in a homeschool situation, a virtual school. We are in a different world. And what happens is I think a lot of people are more stuck in the old model. You know, you go into a school today, I was in a weekly school the other day, uh, and they have computers for every single child. Uh, they actually have a situation where you go into one room and they, they say me the alphabet in Chinese. Uh, these are kids who live in the middle of rural Kenosha County because they were able to use Rosetta Stone and use the technology that really made their school different. And that's wonderful. If the parents want that school, they should have every right. But what if they're in a different school who doesn't have the opportunity to be innovative and they are not doing a good job for their kids and they're two or three grades behind? The only thing we can say is tough luck. That's the current situation that we have. I want the parents to make a choice. If their, their, their child is one or two or three grades behind, take a different way of going as opposed to have a situation right now, which is figure out how to run for the school board and try to make that better. I so want the parents to have the choice. Is there anything in, that, in the governor's proposal regarding vouchers that Democrats would be specifically this? Well, I, you know, let me start with what you ended with, top block. I mean, that's what they're telling the public schools. They're giving them, they're freezing pure people spending in the public schools, which means for the classroom, there'll be no more money. For public schools. And they're looking at a 29% increase in the per people spending for unaccountable vulture schools. Now, why do you see unaccountable? Because the Republicans have refused to require even background checks to teachers, much less requiring them to have to take the same test that every public school student has to take. Or to allow, you know, students with disabilities or Others that are difficult to educate, that are more expensive to educate, in many cases, to be admitted to these culture schools. This is the worst education budget, uh, you know, in my judgment, in terms of just basic equity, fairness, and moving forward. And, and that's saying a lot because financially, the last budget was the worst ever, taking $1.6 billion out of the public schools. So it's almost like we're going to starve the public schools, make it difficult because of class sizes growing, AP course offerings being reduced, and then we're going to give a lot more money to the voucher schools, and we're going to say, look how much better the voucher schools are, are competing. And, and it's just an abysmal budget. But don't ask me, ask the Republicans. I mean, that's how far the Republican Party has gravitated to the right, in my judgment. Because you've got some moderates left, like a Mike Ellis, that says, well, let's at least let us community have a referendum to see if this is what they want in their community. And the governor says, well, no, this is a statewide program. You know, Half of the money, or, or somewhere near half, comes from property taxpayers. And they're going to have their money be taken out in school aids in order to support kids going to these unaccountable voucher schools. Well, why wouldn't you have a referendum? But how can you possibly justify giving 0% for public school classrooms and giving this huge increase for unaccountable voucher schools? That's why there's been so much consternation on the Republican side of the aisle. Because Luther Olson, who, you know, who takes a great interest in public education, is saying, wait a second. He said, how can you say, Governor, that any school district that has two schools that are failing, that students can come from some of the best schools 
and go to a voucher school, which isn't necessarily better. In fact, could be far worse. And then you're not even helping that school that supposedly is struggling. So just common sense measures that Republicans are asking for certainly need to be implemented. So, Speaker Voss, uh, could you uh, be willing to compromise on a requirement in legislation to say communities have to vote on no. this? No. No. Of course not. Do you no, we don't want local control. control. We don't want local control of our education. We want governor control of our education. No, the difference is I am not going to say.